These are all words to do with cells. I'm just checking out your knowledge. Great ant worked in Toronto as a lab tech. Oh, and a first scanning electron microscope. That is cool. Yeah, nice advanced microscope. All right, what is the first one? Cell. Second one? Nucleus. Nucleus. The third one? Membrane. Good. Hey, you can all chime in for these ones if you want. The fourth one? Phospholipid. Phospholipids. Fifth one? Animal. The type of cell. Animal. Six. Plant. Seven. Twice with a P. R. Protist. Protist. <laughs> Good. Eight. Bacteria. Bacteria. Nine. Lysosome. And 10. Ribosome. <laughs> Ribosome. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Why is it important to study cells? Well, all organisms are made of cells, and the cell is the simplest collection of matter that can live. Yeah, and as we saw in the cell lab, there are cells that live just all by themselves, unicellular organisms. What are some unicellular organisms that just live by themselves? Andrea? Protists? Protists. Yeah, most protists are unicellular. Um, what are some of the protists that we looked at? What are the small one? The small uh, yeah. diatoms? <laughs> yes, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates. We were looking at. There are some multicellular protists as well. The out the large seaweeds. Um, amoebas. But some cells live as colonies and some live as a multicellular organism. And we saw in the lab that sometimes there's a, a gray area between being unicellular, but still able to live in a colony, being a colony, but still being able to you know, biff off and live on your own, uh, or being a colony or multicellular. So there's a, a bit of a fine line between those. So to study cells, of course, we use microscopes and the tools of biochemistry. What are cells? They're all just a bunch of chemicals. And we looked at them already, the phospholipids, the proteins, and the carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Uh, we use microscopes. Why? They're too small. You can't see them with the naked eye. And cell theory is one of the great triumphs of biology. In that, it's something that developed over a number of years and had several um, proponents or components or people who studied. And you really needed to have the technology to study them. Without the technology, you wouldn't have studied them. So it is a triumph. So the microscope made it possible. The very earliest microscopes, look at this microscope. <laughs> so it's just so plain, but here's the lens. There's a little needle that holds the specimen. Yeah, and then you look through there to look at the specimen. A very simple microscope, but interestingly, it was made by a Dutch spectacle maker. So who made glasses? Because why would it be a spectacle maker? Well, in order to get a really good image through your glasses, or contact lenses for that matter these days, 
you have to be able to grind the glass so perfectly that there are no aberrations in it. It has to be pure, it has to be ground perfectly. And so it was a natural thing for a spectacle maker who had that glass grinding experience to make microscopes because that's what you need. You need that in your objective lenses, in the ocular lenses. You need to have that beautiful, pure, wonderfully ground lens. Otherwise, just simply all you'll see is aberrations of the lens. So uh, let me ask you this. What are some of the characteristics of life? What distinguishes something that lives from something that doesn't live? From say, a fire compared to an ant? Uh, I love how close Fio is to life because it breathes and reproduces in a way. But yeah. I thought respiration and reproduction, I mean, what is fire missing of something that's alive? Help me yeah. out with it. Cells. Yeah, what is it missing? Exactly. Uh, it is missing reproduction. So as Marcus said, the fire has cells, but they're dead. Um, and life is all made of cells. Yeah, and the fire in the wood that we burn, those, those, those cells are dead. Yeah. Of course, if you were, oh dear, a witch in Salem back in, you know, <laughs> a long time ago, unfortunately, they did burn people at it, which is terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Anyhow, but burning wood, the, the wood cells are not alive. However, fire does consume oxygen and it does give off carbon dioxide. Yeah, totally just like life forms do. And the way it spreads mimics reproduction. So I just, it seems like one of the closest non-alive things to life. Yeah, it is pretty close. It does grow. Yeah, it does grow and it, it dies eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it responds to the environment. And that's another proponent of life or trait of life. Um, what about passing but on But it can't DNA? choose to recreate. It can't choose to right. propagate. Right. It can't choose. No. So its response to the environment is passive. It just simply burns. But the response to the environment of a life form is purposeful. So, for example, if the environment is a light and you're Elodia, you will want to move to the light. And you've seen plants, right? Plants bend toward the light. That's what they do. Yeah, so they do respond to the environment. So and it's you. proven they, they bend away from mean people. Yeah, if, if, yeah, absolutely. If somebody comes along and crunches them or yells, plants are amazingly plastic in that way too. If they're, if they're eaten by herbivores, they'll, they'll um, produce more toxins or even more thorns. Yeah. Even if a neighboring plant is so accosted, it passes on the message to other plants. I think so, yeah. I don't really know that much about, about that, but uh, messages or through I've soil. I've read interesting studies that seem to show yeah. this. Yeah, that plants yeah. Can... I have heard about that. It's probably through uh, soil, some sort of chemicals that they exude into the soil that are detected by other plants, I would imagine. So yeah, all living things composed of one or more cells require energy, carry out metabolic processes, growth and development, respond to environment, maintain homeostasis, a state of internal uh, balance, they reproduce and they pass on traits to their offspring and uh, these two are probably the most characteristic of life. So who in, who saw the first cells? Well, this is Robert Hooke. Should have an E there. <laughs> yeah, so he um, he made microscopes. So this is one of one of Hooke's microscopes. 
Yeah, so it has an ocular up here that he looked through and uh, lenses. Well, one thing that he saw was he looked at plant cork, which is what this is here, plant cork. And he was like, oh yeah, he saw these structures and he said, he thought to himself, they looked like the cells of monks in monasteries. That's where, that's where monks lived, they lived in cells. So he called them cells for that reason, yeah. So he was a microscopist uh, very early on. Um, he was asked to produce the model of an eye to demonstrate, and he created one using an iris diaphragm. So the diaphragm is the um, portion of the microscope that opens and closes to, for light. And that might've been one of his, um, um, reason, one of the reasons why he went into making or inventing microscopes. Yeah, he looked at a lot of different things, wrote a book called Micrographia. So today we call images of anything under the microscope a micrograph, micrograph. So you've taken a lot of micrographs already and sent them into me, which is awesome. Yeah, and one thing I, I would like to emphasize is that, you know, they didn't have uh, cell phones to take pictures through the microscope, but you can do that today, but they had to draw everything. So it was a quite an accomplished drawer, drawing things like fabrics and uh, scales. Even larger animals like this flea. Uh, plant parts like thorns. This is the underside of a plant. So really, really great drawings that persist to this day. Uh, this chap, Nehemiah Grew, he was a botanist and a physician and a microscopist. So, so gentlemen of leisure were often all of these things. Like if you if you had to go and carry the wood you know, gather the wood, carry the water, whatever, if you had to grow your crops, then you didn't really have time to think. But um, gentlemen of leisure generally did, and women of leisure as well, although they would not have been acknowledged back then, unfortunately. Yeah. So here's another microscopist, Marcello Malfigi. They probably founded plant anatomy. So very into plants. Yeah. Here's Malpigi, the anat anatom plantarum. Yeah, he was also a professor of medicine and a physician to uh, the Pope. Kept publishing more and better illustrations. So was also uh, quite adept at drawing. Anton van Leeuwenhoek around the same time. So he was looking through microscopes and he described spermatozoa from all kinds of different things. These are all spermatozoa here from all different organisms. So from insects, dogs, and humans. Um, he drew plant stems and um, nematodes. So here's a nematode. Uh, lots of other organisms that live in the soil like water bears. And he drew them. So he took a pond sample, drew everything in the pond sample, and then he um, called them all animalcules. <laughs> he just termed everything animalcules. But he also discovered bacteria. Yeah, he said he discovered bacteria while viewing scrapings from his teeth and the teeth of others. <laughs> Yeah, nobody would ask him for dinner after a while because he collected things from their teeth and <laughs> wanted to take them home and look at them. Nice, good, nice comments, Katie. So, um, but with all of this data collection, there wasn't a cohesive theory of cells yet, not a conceptual assessment. Um, in 1800, the, 100, the tissue theory that organs are made of tissues became popular. But 
then there, there was better and better microscopes after a while. But there were two major questions. What was the role of the cell? And how do new cells originate? So nobody really knew that yet. That was, that was still very much a question. You know, some people thought that cells generate spontaneously because in um, Egypt and the Nile, frogs would just come out of mud. And it was thought that, oh, the, then the frogs must be made of the mud and just spontaneously generate. But eventually, uh, Schwann, Theodore, that's his name, Theodore Schwann and Matthias Jacob Schlieden developed cell theory. Looking at plant and animal cells. This is a plant cell here. It's got an enormous vacuole that fills with water. That is not the nucleus. In, in the animal cell, this is the nucleus here. And there's lots and lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Plants and animals, they have different cells. But theory, the theory is a really good example of the progress of science with um, technology based on loads and loads of observations. Yeah, but their importance may not have been realized at first. Some of their initial ideas might have been incorrect, but with the advent of more research and better and better microscopes, they came up with a theory based on observation. Not experiments, but just observing a lot. It's really comparable to the theory of evolution and its repercussions of biological phenomena, probably the two most important theories ever to be developed. And of course, we know that a theory in science is such that it is facts that are uh, backed up by many, many different observations and eventually experiments as well. So the cell theory states that the cell is a basic unit of structure and function of all living things, that all living things are composed of one or more cells, and that all cells come from pre-existing cells. That's cell theory. And of course, we had the joy, can I say joy, of using um, a light microscope. And we went over the microscope. It requires a light source, a light source concentrated on the specimen and two lenses that we have in our compound light microscopes, the ocular lens and the objective lens. This is the ocular lens and the eyepiece and the objective lenses. So of course we multiply those together to get the total magnification of anything that we're looking at. So the light microscope, a very useful tool. And then in order to enhance visual, visualization of cellular structures, we have to stain them often because although we can see cells quite readily, we can't always see the ultrastructure. The ultrastructure is the organelles inside the cell. So um, this, for example, this first one here is unstained. It's, a, it's called a bright field. Light passes through, but all you can see is um, the outline. So that's the membrane and the nucleus and some structures inside the cell. So that's not bad. Here's a bright field stain specimen. So what the dye does is it enhances the structures. So here's the cell membrane, the nucleus, and structures inside the cell. Phase contrast can help uh, enhance unstained cells. So this is using phase contrast, which we have on some of our microscopes in the lab. 
There's other types of contrast. This is called differential interference contrast. It gives you a bit of a three-dimensional perspective. And sorry, this one is uh, fluorescence. So in this case, there's different, different um, stains that fluoresce at different colors. Uh, so this is um, actin. And this is various mitochondria, I think. And this is the nucleus. Confocal types of staining and fluorescence. Sorry, it's not a very good slide. It seems to have condensed in the transition. But the point is that there are many ways of enhancing what you're looking at in a microscope. Staining is one of them. Electron microscopes are different. So your ant is using uh, not light, but electrons. Electrons that either go through a specimen in transmission electron microscopy or gather onto the surface, scanning electron microscopy. What does that look like? Well, say we're looking at um, scanning, using a scanning microscope. This is cilia of uh, rabbit's trachea. And you can see how densely packed they are, uh, their curvature and their length in three dimensions, which is quite cool. If you're to look, we're to look at the same thing through a transmission electron microscope, it's a very, very thin um, section because the electrons go through it. And you see things like this. This is the a longitudinal section of a cilium. And here are cross sections. So those are cross sections of a cilium. And then sometimes you'll get more, um, not as long as the whole cilium, but not a circle either. And that's an oblique kind of section. Because when you're slicing something very thin, um, very thinly, like this is the, the membrane and the cilia, well, because there are longitudinal objects, um, there's no way of slicing it in such a way that they'll all be longitudinal or they'll all be cross-sectional. It's just too thin of a specimen. So how big are cells? Well, just to give you a little reminder of sizes. So this is especially useful for um, measuring cells under the microscope. I don't, did we do that in the cell lab? We did measurements, didn't we? Yeah, okay, good. So we have done some measuring. Um, and uh, if you haven't done that before, that's okay. We'll show you how to do it. But just to remind you that um, a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. A millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. A micrometer is one one millionth of a meter. And usually when we're measuring things under the microscope, we measure them in micrometers. Sometimes things, however, are very, very tiny and we measure them in nanometers and that's one billionth of a meter. And so you may be required to uh, do transitions between those, convert from one unit to another. So what can we see under our various microscopes? Well, we're looking at a fish egg quite large, large for a cell, um, even a little bit larger than one millimeter. Plant and animal cells, however, are going to be somewhere here between 10 micrometers and 100 micrometers. Here's an animal cell and a plant cell. Uh, smaller things like bacteria, we're looking at one micrometer or less. Um, a chloroplast, you might be able to see still, that's an organelle, it's quite large. Um, and that will also be in that range. But when we're getting into really teeny things like viruses, for example, this is a, a phage, uh, lipids, they're very small, proteins, small molecules and atoms. Well, we can use the electron microscope to see all of these things, but in atoms, we're going to need a specialized nuclear 
magnetic resonance kind of uh, scanner. So you can you use different microscopes. What about cell size? Well, there is a limit on cell size. I mean, there are some really long cells. Nerve cells are very long. They can be a meter or more. Um, egg cells, very large. Some muscle cells are also very, very long. But there is a limit. So you, a, a single cell uh, wouldn't be the size of a room, for example. And that's because inside the cell are all these organelles that are functioning, doing something, detoxifying your blood or something like that, or digesting food. So the cells are working they need to have material brought in and they're sending material out, but they require quite a lot of nutrients and they're excreting waste also. So when something gets larger, its surface area declines relative to the volume Eventually, the volume is just too great. The surface area cannot provide what the volume of the cell requires. Yeah, so um, here we're looking at a surface area of 5,400 square micrometers. But if we divide this large cube here into um, 27 smaller cubes, our surface area changes to 16,200 square micrometers. How can we separate parts of the cell? There's, there's this um, method known as cell fractionation. It takes them apart separates organelles from one another. That's one way of doing it. Um, another way is using a centrifuge. So I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, fractionation. Um, it isolates cell components based on size and density. First of all, the cells are homogenized in a blender to break them up. The resulting mixture then is called a homogenate. And then that is centrifuged at various speeds and durations. And that fractionates or separates the cell components forming pellets. So let's see what that looks like here. So here we've homogenized the cells in a blender, produced a homogenate, and we'll introduce that into a centrifuge. So this will spin, this will spin. Um, for 10 minutes, if we spin it, a pellet has formed at the bottom. The things on the bottom are going to be heavy relative to the solution. So these are the nuclei and various cellular debris. So we did that at 100 Gs, that's 1,000 times the force of gravity, or sorry, 1,000 Gs. The next time we pour the supernatant the supernatant is this fluid here. And we're going to be doing this when we do our DNA experiment with your DNA. So remember these terms, pellets and supernatant. We put the supernatant into another tube, but we spin it at 20,000 Gs for 20 minutes. That's considerably longer. Well, some of the lighter things then will precipitate out. In this case, some of the lighter things are uh, a pellet here that has mitochondria and chloroplasts if they're from a plant. Those are smaller and lighter, but if we spin it fast enough, they will separate out of the solution. And then we're gonna take the supernatant again. And we're going to spin it at 80,000 Gs for 60 minutes. We'll fractionate. And the supernatant is not what 
condenses at the bottom, but the exactly. rest of the liquid. Yes, okay. thank you for asking. Yeah, the supernatant is what does not condense. Yeah, it's what's left at the top and still has light things in it. When you do it at the DNA lab, um, you know, that's how you'll separate your DNA. DNA is very light. So it will, it will, you'll, you'll mix your cells. You're actually going to boil your cells to get the DNA out. And then you'll centrifuge it, get all the debris out. But this, your DNA will still be in the supernatant. Yeah, so we'll do that in the lab. Um, yeah, so there's a supernatant. Sorry, what do we have here? We have uh, microsomes. So little pieces of plasma membrane, some of the internal membranes. So those are all lipids, they're very light. So it takes quite a lot of force to get them to precipitate out. And then we put the supernatant into 150,000 Gs for three hours. And then we get the lightest parts of our sample out. Here's a pellet and it's got ribosomes in it. They're very small and very light. So that's how we can separate out things. That's how when you give blood, for example, um, then your blood is centrifuged in the same kind of way, depending on what is required from your blood. Yeah. Yeah, so the results are we can use microscopy to identify organelles in each pellet. Um, and it establishes a baseline for further experiments. Say we're going to apply some chemicals or something to the cells. So eukaryotic cells have membranes that compartmentalize their functions. Prokaryotes don't have the membranes. Eukaryotes do. So eukaryotic cells are those of the protists, of the animalia, of the plantae and the fungi. Prokaryotic cells are bacteria, either RK bacteria or U bacteria. So all cells have some basic features in common. Uh, they all have a plasma membrane. They all contain a semifluid substance called the cytosol. They contain chromosomes. They all have ribosomes. That's what they have in common. But prokaryotes, pro means before, karyot means nucleus essentially, or seed sometimes. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, but they have DNA located in what's known as the nucleoid region. Oh, this is a terrible slide. Well, 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 well. Sorry about that. Well, uh, these structures here are pili. They attach to things. Uh, the nucleoid, that's here, nucleoid, that's where the DNA is, the DNA region. And there are a number of ribosomes you can see here. The ribosomes in a bacteria are free. Of course, the ribosomes in an animal cell can be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but the ribosomes are free ribosomes. Um, this outer layer here is a cell wall. A cell wall is important because it uh, maintains structure. And it, it helps you to identify the bacteria as well, which is interesting. Um, bacteria also have often a capsule that's um, 
a coating that also helps to adhere to a host. Bacteria also often have flagellate for locomotion. They have different shapes too. Uh, you'll find in, in 1100, that's the course, the other half of this course, we look at bacteria very closely and we learn how to identify them. Uh, but what we're interested in in this course is the difference in cellular structure between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So you will learn the structure of a bacteria cell, of an animal cell, and of a plant cell, and be able to tell the difference between them. So here are the pili. Now some of those, like one of this long one, could be a sex pili to exchange genetic material. with other bacteria. And since it's not necessarily the same species, uh, Lynn Margulis said once a long time ago that uh, bacteria all swim in the same gene pool. So their ability to exchange DNA um, clouds their genetic differences. These other ones, these other pili here, um, they're probably just for attachment purposes to a host. Yeah, here's a micrograph of E. coli, a prokaryote with two flagellae. Eukaryotic cells contain a true nucleus. They have a membranous nuclear envelope. They're quite a bit bigger and have membrane bound organelles and an endomembrane system. So further for comparison of plant and animal cells, what I'd like to do now is show you a couple of videos. Let me end there for now. Thank you for watching.